There's just one part of the Bible that describes the beginning and the evolution of the universe. And that contradicts the Big Bang. In the Quran, there are many verses that describe how the universe began and how it evolved and none of them contradict the Big Bang. But that's not what's amazing. What's really amazing is that it actually looks like it's describing the beginning and evolution of the universe in the same way that scientists have described it ever since they discovered the Big Bang. This is God's cosmos. One of the key discoveries that led us to the Big Bang is the expansion of the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, This means that the heaven, we have made it with great power and surely, undoubtedly, we are expanding it. Is that a modern interpretation? No, it's an ancient interpretation. Baydawi mentions it. His tafsir is one of the most important tafsirs in our scholarly tradition. It's been part of seminary curricula across the Islamic world for centuries. Is that the only interpretation that Baydawi gives? No, he mentions two other interpretations. Wouldn't that be cherry picking then to pick the one that fits with modern science? No, cherry picking is bad scholarship. It's when you have a conclusion that you want to reach and you select an isolated example that supports your conclusion and you ignore all of the other evidence and all of the other examples. That's not what I'm doing. So someone might say that when you pick one of Baydawi's interpretation and you ignore the others, that's exactly what you're doing. Well, to the average Muslim, that's what it looks like because the average Muslim doesn't understand the ancient Arabian language. He hasn't been trained in the Muslim scholarly tradition. He doesn't know where Baydawi is coming from when he mentions these three interpretations. To him, the three possibilities are all equal. He can't evaluate between them. So when he says that I want the Quran to agree with modern science and he selects one interpretation and he conceals the other two from view, he doesn't tell other people about them, he's cherry picking. That's not what I'm doing. I understand the ancient Arabian language. I've been trained in this scholarly tradition the same way Baydawi has. And we've studied a lot of these things together. We've studied Tafsir, we've studied Balagha. So when I come to this verse, I understand why Baydawi is giving each of these interpretations. I understand his reasoning. And what I'm doing is I'm adding my understanding of the scientific evidence for the expansion of the universe to the mix. And when I do that, I can see that the interpretation that the universe is expanding is the correct one and that the other two are incorrect. And if Baydawi had been alive today and he had added the scientific evidence to the mix as well, he would have said exactly the same thing that I'm saying. Can you explain your reasoning? How do we understand this verse? So the straightforward, literal interpretation of the verse is exactly what I gave. The verse is saying that certainly, undoubtedly, God is expanding the universe right now. That's what science tells us. Every point in space is moving away from every other point in space right now. And new space is being created in between those two points right now. And that's what the verse is saying. God is saying that, the, that He is expanding the universe right now. But this idea that the universe is expanding right now, people haven't believed that in history. Because when you look at the sky, it looks fixed. It looks static. It looks unchanging. So everybody throughout human history has believed that the universe is fixed in size. It's not expanding. So when they came to this verse, it's natural for them to search for some kind of a figurative interpretation. They say, of course, the universe can't be expanding. This verse is saying something else. 
So scholars interpreted the verse according to their scientific knowledge of that time. Yeah. And that's what we're doing now. We're looking at the scientific discoveries of our time and we're interpreting the verse just like they did. Excellent. That's really important. What you've just observed is that if you have a verse of the Quran that describes something in the universe, then when somebody comes to interpret this verse, he has to deal with how he understands the universe to be. He has to deal with his scientific knowledge. If he finds that the scientific knowledge conflicts with the literal interpretation of the verse, then he's going to search for a figurative interpretation. If he finds one, great. If he doesn't find one, then he has to do one of two things. Either he has to say the science is wrong, or he has to say that the Qur'an is wrong. So with this verse, the classical scholars saw that the literal translation or interpretation of this verse conflicted with the scientific knowledge of their time. And that's why they found plausible figurative interpretations to use. Yes, and they found two. So let's look at the key word here. The key word is musi'un, awsa'a, yusi'u, isa'an, fahuwa musi'a. Still remember, sarf class, mashallah, you did great. <laughs> Mauritanian memory, may Allah preserve you. So the, uh, this verb, it's related to the form one verb, wasi'a, which means to be expansive. And so the literal meaning of awsa'a is to make something expansive, to expand. But those who interpreted it figuratively, they said that it means ability. Inna la musi'un doesn't mean we are expanding it right now, but it means we are able, we have power. Surely we have made the heavens with power and surely we're powerful. The idea of power and ability is related to expansiveness because when you're unable to do something, you feel constricted. When you're able to do something, you feel expansive, you can move. And so this is a, a, an acceptable, plausible figurative interpretation. There's actually, it has precedent in the ancient Arabic language. Others, they give it another figurative interpretation. They said it means that God provides. Surely we've made the heaven with power and we surely provide. When God provides us, we feel expansive. We feel like we can move. When we're constricted, we're poor, unable to move. So this is also acceptable, plausible um, figurative interpretation in the ancient Arabian language. It would mean that we have created the heaven with power and surely we provide. A third group of exegetes, they said, no, we're gonna take the literal interpretation. We're going to say that it means that God expanded the universe. But even though this is close to the literal interpretation that I'm giving, it's not quite there because they said it means that God expanded it in the past. It means that God raised up the heaven far above the earth. Now there's a principle in Arabic grammar. We learn that an active participle like Musa literally refers to the present, figuratively to the future and very, very rarely to the past. So. This is close to the literal interpretation, but it's still not quite there. So all of the traditional scholars interpreted it figuratively because they looked up at the sky and they saw that the universe wasn't expanding. Yes, mm. um, they saw that the universe is fixed. They come to this verse, they say, of course it's not expanding right now, mm. it's fixed. They didn't know that it was possible for the universe to be expanding. We now know not only is it possible, it is happening. So if they looked at this verse and they knew that the universe is expanding, they would have all said this. This is the meaning that God intended. This is the meaning that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, understood when he recited this verse to his companions. But the scholars of tafsir couldn't see that. And you know what? The Qur'an actually anticipates it. It's telling them not to interpret it figuratively. How can a verse of the Qur'an tell someone not to interpret it figuratively? Well, you know the inna and the lam in the verse? Inna lamusi'un. Both the inna and the lam are there for emphasis. The Qur'an is emphasizing strongly. When do you use emphasis? Even in the English language. 
if I think that when I say something, you're not going to take it literally. If I were to tell you the universe is expanding and I felt that you're not going to, you're going to think I'm speaking figuratively, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, Muhammad, the universe is expanding. Really, it's expanding right now. And so what this verse is saying is, Inna la musi'un, really, really, undoubtedly, we are expanding it right now. It looks like having religion and science discussions around the Quran requires significant training in the Islamic sciences. Yeah, it does. Because the Quran isn't a newspaper. The Quran is miraculously eloquent. And you have to be able to see that in order to understand what it's saying. And you can learn. You've learned. We've studied Balagha. We've studied Tafsir. The scholars who teach these sciences are still there. And people can take the journey to learn the ancient Arabian language of the Quran. And I encourage everyone to undertake this journey just like you did, because the result is really amazing, especially when you add science to it. It's subhanAllah, it's really amazing. Are there other verses like this in the Quran? Yep, there are. Let's look at it in the next episode. Let's do that. If you like this episode, then check out my Why Islam is True course in which I teach you four rational arguments that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself used to show that Islam is true. Learning on YouTube is great, but if you want to reach a learning goal, a learning destination, like how to make rational arguments, how to think critically as a Muslim, how to engage with modern science as a Muslim, then you need to follow a map that's been specifically designed to take you to your learning goal, step by step through a series of carefully designed learning objectives and learning activities that take you to your final learning destination. That's how this course has been designed. This course shows you the what, the why, and the how. It shows you what we believe as Muslims, it shows you why those beliefs are based on evidence and 100% true based on Quranic rational arguments. And it shows you how to use those arguments to address common objections against Islam by atheists and others on topics such as evolution, the problem of evil, the age of Aisha, and much more. It consists of 20 modules and it includes bi-weekly live sessions with me pre-recorded lessons with 81 bite-sized videos, 247 application activities and real-world scenarios, a 24-7 community where you can ask a question and get it answered within 24 hours, and there's an option to buy a course textbook as well. Find out more at www.whyislamistrue forward slash course and learn why Islamic seminaries are adopting this course as part of their curriculum to train the next generations of scholars. This course is actually the first and prerequisite course in the Basira classical curriculum in modern context, a four-year curriculum consisting of 31 courses that will teach you everything that a Muslim needs to know about their deen and be ready for modern society. This four-year Basira seminary curriculum is based entirely on the Muslim scholarly tradition, but it teaches you how to apply that tradition to the world in which we live, and it's taught completely in English. Why Islam is True is the first course in that 31-course curriculum. Check it out at www.whyislamistrue.com forward slash course.